Chancellor Murphy, Platform Associate, members of the faculty and members of the student body of this great institution of learning, ladies and gentlemen. I need not pause to say how very delighted and honored I am to be with you today and to be a part of your lecture series. It is always a rich and rewarding experience when I can take a brief break from the day-to-day -day demands of our struggle for freedom and human dignity in the South and discuss the issues involved in that struggle with college and university students and concerned friends of goodwill all over the nation. And so I say it is a great privilege and a rich opportunity to be with you. As I stand here, I'm so deeply indebted as min millions of other people are uh, to this great institution for all that it has given uh, to the cultural and intellectual life of our nation and of the world. And so I say thank you and I also want to thank you for the support that you've given our struggle in the South and all over this country. That is a desperate question, a poignant question on the lips of millions of people all over our nation and all over the world. I get it almost every day. It is a question of whether we are making any real progress in the area of race relations. And so I want to try to answer that question and deal with many of the issues involved by using as a subject from which to speak the future of integration. Now there are some people who feel that we aren't making any progress. There are some people who feel that we are making overwhelming progress. I would like to take what I consider a realistic position and say that we have come a long, long way in the struggle to make justice and freedom a reality in our nation, but we still have a long, long way to go. And it is this realistic position that I would like to use as a basis for our thinking together. Now let us notice first that we've come a long, long way. And in order to illustrate this, a little history is necessary. You will remember that it was in the year 1619 when the first Negro slaves landed on the shores of this nation. They were brought here from the soils of Africa. Unlike the Pilgrim Fathers who landed at Plymouth a year later, they were brought here against their wills. And throughout slavery, the Negro was treated in a very inhuman fashion. He was a thing to be used, not a person to be respected. The famous Dred Scott decision of 1857 well illustrated the status of the Negro during slavery. For in this decision, the Supreme Court of our nation said in substance that the Negro is not a citizen of the United States, he is merely property subject to the dictates of his own. And it went on to say that the Negro has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. 
And as slavery grew and developed, it became necessary to give some justification for it. It seems to be a fact of life that human beings cannot continue to do wrong without eventually reaching out for some thin rationalization to clothe an obvious wrong in the beautiful garments of righteousness. And this is exactly what happened during the period of slavery. Even religion and the Bible were misused in order to justify slavery and crystallize the patterns of the status quo. And so from some pulpits it was argued that the Negro was inferior by nature because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham. And then the Apostle Paul's dictum became a watchword, servants be obedient to your master. And then one brother had probably read the logic of the great philosopher Aristotle. You know Aristotle did a great deal to bring into being what we now know as formal logic and philosophy. And in uh, formal logic, there's a big word called the syllogism, which has a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And so this brother decided to put his argument for the inferiority of the Negro in the framework of an Aristotelian syllogism. He came out with his major premise, all men are made in the image of God. Then came his minor premise, God, as everybody knows, is not a Negro, therefore the Negro is not a man. This was the kind of reasoning that prevailed. Or living with the conditions of slavery and then later segregation, many Negroes lost faith in themselves and many came to feel that perhaps they were inferior. Perhaps they were less than human. But then something happened to the Negro. Circumstances made it possible and necessary for him to travel more. The coming of the automobile, the upheavals of two world wars, the Great Depression. And so his rural plantation background gradually gave way to urban industrial life. Even his economic life was gradually rising through the growth of industry, the influence of organized labor, expanded educational opportunities. Even his cultural life was rising through the steady decline of crippling illiteracy. And all of these forces conjoined to cause the Negro to take a new look at himself. Negro masses all over began to reevaluate themselves. And the Negro came to feel that he was somebody. His religion revealed to him that God loves all of his children and that all men are made in his image and that the basic thing about a man is not his specificity but his fundamental, not the texture of his hair or the color of his skin, but his eternal dignity and worth. And so the Negro could now unconsciously cry out with the eloquent poet, fleecy locks and black complexion, cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. Were I so tall as to reach the pole or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. And the mind is the standard of the man. With this new sense of dignity and this new sense of self-respect, a new Negro came into being with the term determination to suffer, to struggle, to sacrifice in order to be free. And so in a real sense, we've come a long, long way since 1619. The Negro has come a long, long way in re-evaluating his own intrinsic worth. But not only has the Negro come a long, long way in reevaluating his own intrinsic worth, if we're to be true to the facts, we must admit that the whole nation has come a long, long way in extending the frontiers of civil rights. Fifty years ago, and at points even 25 years ago, a year hardly passed when numerous Negroes were not brutally lynched by some vicious mob in the South. 
but lynchings have about ceased today. This reveals that we've made some strides. At the turn of the century, there were very few Negroes registered to vote in the South. By 1948, that number had leaped to 750,000. By 1960, that number had leaped to 1 million 200,000, and it is still going up in spite of opposition. This reveals that some progress has been made. Even in the economic area, we've seen some developments. The average Negro wage earner who happens to be employed today earns 10 times more than the average Negro wage earner of 12 years ago and the national income of the Negro is now at about $30 billion a year, which is more than all of the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada. This reveals that there has been some progress on this level. But probably more than anything else, we've seen in our day and in our age, the gradual breakdown of the system of legal segregation we all know the history of this system. It had its legal beginning in 1896, when the Supreme Court of the nation rendered what was known as the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, establishing the doctrine of separate but equal as the law of the land. And we all know what happened as a result of the Plessy doctrine. There was always a strict enforcement of the separate without the slightest intention to abide by the equal. The Negro ended up being plunged into the abyss of exploitation, where he experienced the bleakness of nag and injustice. But then in 1954, the Supreme Court of our nation examined the legal body of segregation and on May 17th pronounced it constitutionally dead. It said in substance that the old Plessy doctrine must go, that separate facilities are inherently unequal, and that to segregate a child on the basis of his race is to deny that child equal protection of the law. And so since the rendering of that decision, we've seen numerous developments in our country. And then along with this, Almost 10 years later, our nation passed a comprehensive civil rights bill. It was passed on July 2nd, 1964, signed by President Johnson. And I'm happy to report that communities all across the South, even in the hardcore South, are compl complying with that uh, civil rights bill, particularly the public accommodation section with amazing good sense and reasonableness. This reveals that we are making some strides. And so to put it figuratively in biblical language, we've broken loose from the Egypt of slavery. And we have moved through the wilderness of legal segregation. And now we stand on the border of the promised land of integration. And I'm absolutely convinced that the system of segregation is on its deathbed today, and the only thing uncertain about it is how costly the segregationists will make the funeral. We've come a long, long way since 1896. Now this would be a wonderful place for me to end my speech. First it would mean making a relatively short speech, and that would be a magnificent accomplishment for a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Secondly, it would mean that the problem is about solved, and it would be a marvelous thing if speakers all over our country could talk about this problem in terms of a problem that once existed but that no longer has existence. But if I stop at this point, I will merely be stating a fact and not telling the truth. You see, a fact is merely the absence of contradiction, but truth is the presence of coherence. Truth is the relatedness of facts. 
Now, it's a fact that we've come a long, long way, but it isn't the whole truth. And uh, I'm afraid if I stop at this point, I will leave you the victims of a dangerous optimism. If I stop at this point, I may send you away the victims of an illusion wrapped in superficiality. So in order to tell the truth, it is necessary to move on and say, not only we've come a long, long way, but we have a long, long way to go before the problem of racial injustice is solved. I don't think I have to stay on this point too long. We need only turn on our televisions and open our newspapers and look around in our communities. And we know that no section of our country can boast of clean hands in the area of brotherhood. I mentioned the fact that lynchings have about ceased. But we must see the other side. Brutal murders are still taking place. Think of the three civil rights workers murdered in Mississippi last summer, and nothing has been done about it. In the state of Alabama, under the administration of Governor George Wallace, exactly 10 Negroes and their white supporters have been brutally murdered, and nobody has been convicted for a single murder. Churches are being burned and bombed. And in Mississippi, it seems now that they have a new motto, not attend the church of your choice, but burn the church of your choice. Oh, how tragic this is. All of this reminds us that injustice still stalks the land, tragic lawlessness we find in so many of its dimensions. Alabama is still a state. Mississippi is still a state. Louisiana and I could go right on, where murder is a sort of favorite pastime. A reign of terror, the Klan continues its ugly activities. All of this comes to remind us that we have a long, long way to go. I mentioned the fact that we had made some strides in the area of voter registration. We now have a little more than two million Negroes registered in the South. Now that looks fairly well, but when you think of the fact that there are still a little more than 10 million Negroes who still live in the South, about six million are of voting age, and only about two million registered, which means there are four million Negroes in the South who are not registered to vote. And it isn't only because of apathy, a lack of motivation. In so many instances, as Selma continues to remind us, Negroes cannot register and they cannot vote. All types of conniving methods are still being used to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. They face intimidation when they go to the courthouses. They are harassed. They face economic reprisals. I was in Selma just last week only to discover that a few more than 200 Negroes have been fired from their jobs simply because they went down to the courthouse to register and vote. Most of them are heads of households. And think of the little children who will go hungry. Think of the wives and mothers who will go hungry and who will not have the basic necessities of life simply because they wanted to register and vote something that is sacred in our great nation and in our democratic government. This reminds us that we have a long, long way to go. And then the complex literature tests are still being given. The other day I studied the one they give in Alabama very thoroughly. And I'm absolutely convinced that Chief Justice Warren would flunk it in the first minute of picking it up. <laughs> Questions are so absurd on that and so ridiculous and so complicated that a person with a PhD in any field or a person with a law degree from the finest law schools of our nation could not answer them. And this is what we still face. 
And so this reveals that we still have a long, long way to go on the voting front. I mentioned economic justice, and I gave a big figure, $30 billion, as the figure that tells us about the annual income and buying power of the Negro. But when we look at the other side, it tells us that we still have a great deal of work to do. But that other side reminds us that 42% of the Negro families of our country still earn less than $2,000 a year, while just 17% of the white families earn less than $2,000 a year. 21% of the Negro families of our country still earn less than $1,000 a year, while just 5% of the white families earn less than $1,000 a year. 88% of the Negro families of our country still earn less than $5,000 a year, while just 58% of the white families earn less than $5,000 a year. And this reveals to us that we have a long, long way to go. And another problem has come into being because of the social injustices and the neglect of the past. We have inherited a difficult problem in every major city of our country. The Negro has been denied educational opportunities in so many instances. Then covered up in ghettos, crowded in overcrowded, woefully inadequate schools. And so he was denied the opportunity in many instances, denied the opportunity for the apprenticeship training. And for this reason, we have been limited by and large to semi-skilled and unskilled labor, but not a force called automation and cybernation came into being. And these are the jobs that are passing away and it compounds a problem that the Negro confronts because he faces the double blow of outright discrimination in employment and the displacement of the sociological changes that are developing as a result of automation. And the concerned society must do something about this. Massive public works programs, massive retraining programs must come into being in order to grapple with this problem. Or when people are walking the streets hungry, when they have no jobs, when they see life as a long and desolate corridor with no exit sign, they become bitter. And that is nothing more dangerous for any society than to develop a large segment of that society and leave them with the feeling that they have no stake in the society, that they have nothing to lose. These are the people who will not listen to the pleas of nonviolence. These are the people who will riot because they see no way out. And so the massive social problems that can result as a result of the economic problem must be dealt with. And this reveals that we have a long, long way to go. And let me say that even though I said we had made great strides on the question of segregation, the problem that is not yet solved. Now it may be true that, as I said, figuratively speaking, old man segregation is on his deathbed, but history has proven that social systems have a great last minute breathing power and the guardians of the status quo are always on hand with their oxygen tents to keep the old order alive. And we have to face the fact that segregation is still with us. We still have it in its hardcore farms in some parts of the South. And we still have it in its de facto expressions in almost every state and city of our Union. But I'm absolutely convinced that if democracy is to live, segregation must die. Segregation is a cancer in the body politic which must be removed before our moral health can be realized. And so the great challenge facing America is to get rid of racial segregation in all of its dimensions. And this must be done not merely to meet the communist challenge, as important as this happens to be. It must be done not merely to have a good image in the world and we we want this image, and we must have it. 
It must be done not merely to appeal to Asian and African peoples. In the final analysis, racial injustice must be uprooted from American society because it is morally wrong. Segregation is evil, to use the words of the great Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, because it substitutes an I-it relationship for the I-thou relationship. Now, to go back to the thinking and thinking of St. Thomas Aquinas, it is evil because it is based on human laws that are out of harmony with the moral, the natural, and the eternal laws of the universe. Somewhere the Protestant theologian Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. What is racial segregation but an existential expression of man's tragic estrangement, this awful separation, his terrible sinfulness? And so we must solve this problem, not merely because it is diplomatically expedient, but because it is morally compelling. This is a great challenge facing America. Now, in order to do it, in order to solve the problem, we've got to develop massive action programs all over the nation. This problem will not work itself out. We must work at it on a day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour -hour basis. Now, to develop this kind of action program, we've got to get rid of one or two myths that are constantly disseminated around our nation. One is the myth of time. Now, you've heard this, I'm sure. There are those people who contend that only time can solve the problem. And they say to the Negro and his allies in the white community, just be patient, don't push things too fast, and if you wait 100 or 200 years, time will work it out. But I think there's an answer to this myth, and it is that time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. And I hate to say that I am absolutely convinced that the forces of ill will of our nation, the forces committed to negative ends of our nation, the extreme writers of our nation, have often used time much more effectively than the people and the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people who will bomb a church in Birmingham, Alabama, but also for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God and without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of st social stagnation. And so we must help time and we must realize that the time is always right to do right. Now that is another notion that gets around a great deal. It is the idea that legislation really doesn't have a role to play if it can't really solve the problem, you've got to change the heart. We hear this all over the country, that you've got to change the heart and you can't change it through uh, legislation. Well, I would say that there may be some truth in this, that you can't change the heart through legislation at that moment. I may go along with that argument. But I would have to go on to say it may be true that you can't legislate integration, but you can legislate desegregation. It may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law can make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. So while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men. And when you change the habits of men pretty soon, the attitudes and the hearts will be changed. And so that is a need for strong legislation constantly to grapple with the problems that we face. Right now, a civil rights bill dealing with voting is being debated in the Congress of our nation. 
And I think this is one of the most important bills facing our nation today. This bill came into being as a result of our movement in Selma, Alabama, a movement articulating the longings and aspirations of the Negro people of the Black Belt for freedom and for the right to vote. And this movement dramatized the issue so much that the president of our nation, backed up, I'm sure, by the vast majority of people of our nation, came forth calling for new civil rights legislation to guarantee the right to vote. But there are forces right now in the Senate seeking to emasculate that bill. They are seeking to do it already. They are seeking to hold on to the poll tax and not bother that. And they are seeking at points to bring in other amendments which will give us another weak bill. And I think all people of goodwill must mobilize our resources and say to the Congress of our nation that we must have a voting bill this time which will end the need for a voting bill any time in the future. The right to vote must be guaranteed for every citizen of our nation and every obstacle must be removed, even the poll tax, which still exists on a state level in Texas, in Alabama, in Mississippi, and in Virginia. Legislation is necessary to grapple with this problem and certainly to grapple with the employment problem, to grapple with the housing problem. We need strong legislation, and it is sad indeed that there are trends in our country which reveal to us that many of our white brothers have not come to the point of being willing, of willingly living next door to a Negro. And so we know of Proposition 14 in California, and I think there must be on the part and certainly in the attitudes and certainly in the minds of people of goodwill, a determination to do away with these obstacles to brotherhood in community neighborhood living. This reveals too that we have a long, long way to go. Now in all of our work and all of our activities, our movement must be undergirded with a philosophy. And I'd like to say just a few words about the philosophy, the undergirding philosophy, which is nonviolent resistance, which has guided and which has undergirded our movement all of these years in the South and over the nation. First, I am convinced that this method is the strongest method available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and human dignity. I'm absolutely convinced and if the Negro succumbs to the temptation of using violence in his struggle, unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness, and our chief legacy to the future will be an endless reign of meaningless chaos. But that is another way, and it is this way of nonviolent resistance. And this method has a way of disarming the opponent. It exposes his moral defenses, it weakens his morale, and at the same time, it works on his conscience, and he just doesn't know how to handle it. If he doesn't beat you, wonderful. If he beats you, you develop the quiet courage of accepting blows without retaliating. If he doesn't put you in jail, wonderful. Nobody within a sense loves to go to jail. But if he puts you in jail, you go in that jail and transform it from a dungeon of shame to a haven of freedom and human dignity. Even if he tries to kill you, you develop the inner conviction that there are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they are worth dying for. And if a man has not discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. The nonviolent movement gives an individual the capacity to stand up against an evil, unjust system. Without violence, without hatred in his heart, but willing to risk even his life in order to give witness to the truth as he sees it. Another thing about this method is that it makes it possible for you to struggle and yet maintain an attitude of active goodwill toward the perpetrators of the old order. I guess this is one of the most misunderstood aspects 
of uh, the nonviolent discipline when it goes over to the area of talking about loving people. People ask me all the time, what in the world do you mean when you say love these people who are oppressing you? And I always have to stop and say, you know, give, try to give the meaning of love in this context. It would be nonsense to urge oppressed people to love their violent oppressors in an affectionate sense. That would be nonsense. But fortunately, the Greek language comes to our aid here. There are three words in Greek for love. One is the word eros. Eros is a sort of aesthetic love. Plato talked about it a great deal in his dialogues, a yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. It has come to us to be a sort of romantic love. And so we all know about this. We've experienced it and read about it in all of the beauties of literature. In a sense, Edgar Allan Poe was talking about Eros when he talked about his beautiful Annabelle Lee with the love surrounded by the halo of eternity. In a sense, Shakespeare was talking about Eros when he said, Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark. You know, I can remember that because I used to quote it to my wife when we were quoting. That's Eros. <laughs> uh, the Greek, Greek language talks about phileo, which is another level of love. It's a sort of intimate affection between personal friends. It's a reciprocal love on this level. You love people that you like. You love because you are loved. This is friendship. And then the Greek language comes out with another word. It is a word agape. Agape is more than romantic or aesthetic love. Agape is more than friendship. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. And when one rises to love on this level, he loves every man. And even though he has on the basis of that love to stand up against the evils which have been structured in society, even though he will have to demonstrate, he will have to boycott, he will have to sit in, he will have to march, he will have to picket. He looks in the face of his most violent opponent. And you, he says, he is that way because he was taught that. For generations his parents taught him, even his church taught him that, his schools taught him that, his culture taught him that. And somehow you look into his face and you seek to tear down the unjust system while maintaining an active attitude of goodwill toward the perpetrator of that unjust system, you rise to the level of loving the person who does the evil deed while hating the deed that the person does. And I believe it is this kind of love which will lead us out of this dark night of racial injustice to a brighter day of brotherhood. Somehow in our most difficult moments. At times we've been able to rise up to the essence of nonviolence. We've been able to look into the eyes of our most violent opponents and say in substance, we will match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will and we will still love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. So throw us in jail and we will still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at the midnight hour and drag us out on some wayside road and beat us and leave us half dead. And as difficult as it is, we will still love you. Threaten our children and bomb our homes and we will still love you. Be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day we will win our freedom. But we will not only win freedom for ourselves, we will so appeal to your heart and your conscience that we will win you in the process. And our victory will be a double victory. This is the meaning of nonviolence. And when we grasp it, we will not seek to rise from a position of disadvantage to one of advantage, thereby subverting justice. We will not substitute one tyranny for another, but we will know that a doctrine of black supremacy is as dangerous and evil as a doctrine of white supremacy. 
and that ultimately God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men, but God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race and the creation of a society where all men will live together as brothers and every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. And this, with this philosophy, I believe that we can go this additional dis distance, working hard, mobilizing our forces. And may I say to you that there is still a need for more people to become actively involved in the movement. I would urge all men of goodwill to become involved participants rather than detached spectators. This summer, we will be working all across the South in my organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We have what is known as a SCOPE project, the Summer Community Organization and Political Education problem, uh, Project. After the Civil Rights Bill, the voting bill is passed, it will be necessary to get Negroes registered to vote by the thousands. And I believe in 10 weeks through our SCOPE project, we can double the number of Negro registered voters in the Black Belt South. And we are asking at least 2,000 students from Northern and Western and other universities over our nation to join us and come into these communities. We will be working in 120 counties and we will be working in these Black Belt counties to get Negroes registered and to get the kind of political education going that will bring the awareness and the determination to register. It seems to me that this is a noble task that any student could participate in. We must have a sort of domestic freedom corps and by the thousand students and faculty members will continue to come into the Deep South and aid us in the struggle. In short, that is still a great deal of work to be done. And as I said, no community can boast of clean hands in this area, and this problem will not be solved until we develop a sort of divine discontent all over America. There are certain technical words within every academic discipline which soon become stereotypes and cliches. Every academic discipline has its technical nomenclature. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is a word maladjusted. And certainly we all want to live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But I must honestly say to you this afternoon, my friends, there are some things within our world and our nation of which I'm proud to be maladjusted which I call upon all people of goodwill to be maladjusted until the good societies realize. I must honestly say that I never intend to become adjusted to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to become adjusted to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few but I recognize that there are between 40 and 50 million of our brothers and sisters in this country who are perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. And I will never adjust myself to these conditions. I will never be satisfied until all of God's children will have the basic necessities of life. I must honestly say, and I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence. But in a day when Sputniks and explorers are dashing through outer space and guided ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win a war. It is no longer the choice between violence and non-violence. It is either non-violence or non-existence. And the alternative to disarmament the alternative to a greater suspension of nuclear tests, the alternative to strengthening the United Nations and thereby disarming the whole world may well be a civilization plunged into the abyss of annihilation. And so maybe we need a new organization in our world, the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. Men and women who will be as maladjusted.
men and women who will be as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day will cry out in words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, as maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation could not survive half slave and half free, as maladjusted as Thomas Jefferson, who in the midst of an age amazingly adjusted to slavery, could etch across the pages of history words lifted to cosmic proportions. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as maladjusted as Jesus of Nazareth, who could say to the men and women of his day, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. And through such maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. And may I say to you in conclusion that I believe we will go that additional distance. I still have faith in America, and I still believe that even though we have some more difficult days in Alabama and Mississippi and all over, that somehow this problem can and will be solved. That we are mobilizing forces and we have a coalition of conscience and a grand alliance now that will bring an end to the injustices that have been with us for so long. I still have the faith to believe that we shall overcome before the victory is won. Some more will get scarred up a bit before the victory is won, some more will be thrown into jail. Before the victory is won, many will be misunderstood and called bad names simply because they are determined to stand up. Before the victory is won, maybe somebody else like a Mrs. Lou Uzzo, a Reverend James Reeb or Jimmy Lee Jackson may have to face physical death. But if physical death is the price that some must pay to free their children and their white brothers from an eternal death of the spirit, then nothing can be more redemptive. Yes, we shall overcome. And I have faith in the future because I know somehow that although the arc of the moral universe is long, it bends toward justice. And that is something in this universe which justifies Carlisle in saying, no lie will live forever. That is something in this universe that justifies William Cullen Bryant in saying, truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, we shall overcome because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mounting of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation and to a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands all over this nation and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you.